Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. My name is Henry Appel. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Claremont Journal of Law and Public Policy. Uh, today, we're fortunate enough to bring you uh, Mark Penn, a man who has had an extraordinary career um, in the world of business and public policy. Uh, a little background on Mr. Penn. He got a start at a young age, probably younger than a lot of us in this room are right now. Um, in his dorm room at Harvard in 1975, he established a polling firm with his roommate, Penn Schoen which would later become Penn, Schoen, Berlin, and Associates. Since then, his firm has provided pub uh, since then, his firm has provided polling services to political campaigns and governments across the globe, including Bill Clinton's administration in the 1990s. Mr. Penn left Penn, Schoen, Berlin, and Associates in 2012 to take a position with Microsoft as Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer. He brings with him today 40 years of experience working with government and business alike. Uh, we're very lucky to have him uh, here to speak with us today about new micro trends. Uh, please welcome Mr. Mark Penn to the stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm really pleased uh, that we all here today. Uh, I appreciate, and uh, you know, not only uh, not only here because I used to poll for the president or wrote a book. Uh, called Microtrends a few years ago, but uh, most importantly, I have a graduating senior, my daughter Margot Penn, uh, who invited me. <laughs> and so uh, I'm glad to give you a talk. You know, I couldn't really decide to talk about uh, politics or technology, uh, but, but you know, I, I really thought I'd really talk about some of the trends that I see going on today. Um, I thought I'd talk at I titled it Politics to Dating just to get you here, and I think that was successful. Uh, so I'm not really going to talk about dating, but... Uh, uh, but uh, uh, but uh, I, did, I did really kind of, you know, I always say that the reason we are so bad about predicting the future is that we don't understand the present. That actually, we typically have about a five-year misperception of the present and so therefore we kind of we kind of are behind five years in the future. And and very often I think we, we have to really uh, keep looking, you know, at data and, and how things are changing so that when we when we're out in the world, and maybe some of you will go on to, you know, uh, public policy or some of you will go into business, uh, but whatever field you're in. You know, I went, into, I went into polling, and polling was about generating data that might make a difference for politicians or at Microsoft. Uh, a lot of what I do, you know, is trying to figure out how the changing marketplace, you know, could really affect uh, technology. And so I, I thought I'd, I'd really focus on that. And, and I wrote a book a few years ago, which is now beginning to get uh, out of date, uh, but the basic pattern that I observed in the book seems to be coming uh, more true than ever, which is, that, which is that the world isn't made up of just a few big trends, but that it is made up of hundreds of smaller trends or micro trends, and that the, the world itself is, is much more uh, like an impressionist painting, that you can step back and take a look at it holistically, but that you also have to take a look at the individual dots uh, that, that are occurring in, in the world, and that many of those dots are actually quite, quite contradictory, and that only when you look at the dots and the various trends that are happening, that you discover that today that the world is in fact so diverse and moving in so many contradictory directions that you can have you know, the most scientifically driven world that, that we've ever had, and yet you could have you know, the most conflict that we've ever had almost uh, on, on the subject of religion going on at exactly the same time, right? And you say, how is that possible? Because, because a, a certain percentage of the world is driven in one direction to be science-oriented, and another percentage of the world is driven to be, to be religious-oriented, and they move in exactly opposite directions, and so much of the world is actually driven in, in completely opposite uh, micro-trends, that it explains many of the dichotomies that we see going on uh, at the same time. 
Uh, and, I, and I think that that's become more and more obvious you know, uh, every day. And then economically, something very important has gone on. We have gone from, what I, <clears throat> from the Ford economy uh, to what I call the, the Starbucks economy. So when you think about mass production, uh, Henry Ford thought, look, we're going to have all of these people, and we've got to get them all cars or clothes or food. And, and of course, what we're going to do to make it cheap and inexpensive is you're going to have any color you want as long as it's black meaning that we're going to drive down the price of things to be standardized as cheaply as possible, and that's how we're going to feed and clothe the world. And he turned out just to be absolutely wrong, right? Because what we've really had is the low-cost availability of choice, right, and the rise of the Starbucks economy. It turned out that people love choice, right? And so you go into Starbucks, and there's now 155 different varieties of even the simplest possible thing that you could possibly ask for, which is a cup of coffee, right? And in fact, you know, in society now, there's, there's a virtually unlimited amount of choice in anything, and it drives so many products. But it's very interesting, in Starbucks, when you go in, really, Starbucks does all of the labor, right, involved. You know, you go in and you order it. Give me, you know, a frappa, a mochaccino, latte, etc and they do it all. Uh, but if you take a look at the original iPod, the iPod was very interesting because there was any color you wanted as long as it was white. So the manufacturing price of the process was usually standardized, and you did the customizing because you picked all the song tracks. So the value was in customization, but you did the work. And so it's quite interesting. You just look at the products and technology. So Facebook, you do the work, right? So think about all the products that are customized and the value you get out of it today is customized. And then what happened too is that choice became a part of what people wanted. You know, if America in the 50s was conformist, if your neighbor had a white picket fence, you wanted a white picket fence. Today, if your neighbor has a white picket fence, you put up a purple one just to be different. I mean, it became ingrained in society. So I defined microtrends. I said, look, <clears throat> there are a lot of trends, whether it's becoming a blogger or, <clears throat> or, or, or something different in society that was going to have impact in society. It didn't have to grow to become the majority of society anymore, to be significant and to be a microtrend and to be important, and most importantly, to be a critical component of the picture that is society. So having defined microtrends, and then just kind of step back and kind of give you a little bit of a picture of how society is changing and, and how we have some misperceptions about society. First, if I were to come to this room, or if anyone were to, were to come from another planet and turn on the TV, they would invariably figure that this must be an incredibly young society dominated by people who are 18 to, 20, 18 to 29. Well, this society, in America at least, has never been older. The median age keeps going up, right? It is now actually 37. So we are an older and older society. And in fact, uh, when John F. Kennedy was elected 18 to 29, outnumbered over 65, 2 to 1 in the electorate. And now we're crossing the line so that, it, so that now over 65 is outnumbering. And yet, everything would appear to still be about youth, despite the fundamental change in society. And you know, this isn't true just here in the, in the United States. A lot of societies, Japan, Italy, the UK, South Korea, the US, uh, China, because of their uh, policies more than anything else, all have median ages now over 35. You know, it turns out that when people get money, one of the first things they get rid of is kids. It turns out when people have extra time and money, they don't want more kids. And you look down at the bottom where they have the most kids, they don't have the money. There are some amazing youth societies out there. Most of them are in the Mideast or in Africa or in some places in, in Latin America. Typically where income is lowest, the, kid, the need for kids is greatest, right? 
But it's a fascinating phenomenon that as societies get richer, they don't say, now I can afford to have another kid. Now I can afford not to. <laughs> OK. Now let's take a look at an interesting trend in TV that goes along with the trend of, of, of microtrends. So we all know TV's changed, and it's changing again, right? Because it's changing from the, the cable TV trend over the top. But in 1990, there used to be just basically three networks, and there were 98 shows. So when you only had 98 shows, a big hit really needed to, to cover 22% of the, of, the, of the population would tune in at night. This was enormous when somebody would. So in order to attract 22%, what kind of jokes do you need on that show? You need really common denominator jokes that everybody gets, right? If you, if, you know, if you tell a joke about the 12th night, Shakespeare's 12th night, it's not going to wash. Right? So, so in sophisticated cocktail parties, nobody talked about TV in 1990. So then what happened was we got, we got another couple hundred TV channels. Right? And so to be an economic success on TV, you didn't need 20% anymore. In fact, if you got 8%, you were a huge hit. So now, when you told those jokes, you could slice off just a small percentage. So now you could have really sophisticated TV that just the top 5% really liked. So suddenly you have House of Cards, Game of Thrones, Breaking Bad. Then you also have some really grungy TV on the other end, right? Because now everyone could have TV, and TV is reborn because the economic model and the ability to have micro-trended TV was born because the economics changed. And it, it'll change. It'll be interesting to see how over the top changes. And then when you go to a cocktail party in Washington, suddenly when you ask the question, do you watch TV? They all say, yes, I watch House of Cards. Now, I just want to talk to you about a phenomenon. There's so much attention I find given to ADDers. They're always saying, the American public in particular, they can't sit still. We've got to make everything shorter. You know, Mark, this talk is way too long, okay? So the truth is, we don't pay enough attention for the LASers, the long attention spanners. And the truth is, the only people who really drive a lot of successes are the LASers. Forget the ADDers, they're worthless at a lot of these things, okay? <laughs> right, because the average bestseller has in fact grown 100 pages. The two highest grossing movies, when you think about it, like Avatar, they're hugely long, right? Puzzles and marathons and chess are on the rise. And then like 61, like Netflix. Who does Netflix really appeal to? Right, 61% of Netflix users binge watch two to six episodes of TV in one sitting. They don't even go to the bathroom. Yeah. So when you think about it, the LASers are an incredible group. Right? And nobody says, hey, I'm an LASer, right? I have a long attention span. Right? And we don't, even, we don't even cultivate people and say, we don't make them proud to really burrow into information. Right? But it turns out that those people really drive the internet, they drive entertainment, they drive a lot of things. Right? And so we want people to really, uh, to really think of themselves. Now, this is one of the most important trends that I think society has not yet discovered. Right? <clears throat> the percentage of 19-year-olds uh, <clears throat> with a driver's license. In 1983, that was 87%. In 2010, that was below 70%. Now, this is going to have profound impact right, on the auto industry uh, in the United States because you can't sell a car to people without a license. Right? <laughs> Hopefully not. Right? And, and whether it's because of mass transit, it's interesting, I was, I was positing this with a group of parents the other day, and they said, I know why my kid doesn't have a license, because I drive them everywhere. And they were explaining that years ago, parents never drove their kids the way they drove them today. So, so the kids had to get a license out of necessity. Right? And, and so, but this is an enormous change, and of course, 
Of course, the, the upper class answer is, well, there's Uber now, right? But the truth is, between car sharing, if you look at mass transit, car sharing, and also one of the trends I'll point out, uh, the, the de-ruralization of America, right? This is going to have, you know, if the, if the auto industry loses, uh, you know, 35% of its marketplace without really realizing it, uh, that's going to have a profound impact on employment and manufacturing in the United States. Uh, and I don't think, <clears throat> when I talk about being five years behind, the auto industry has a lot of catch up uh, on some of the trends that are going on. Um, this is a trend that I think affects a lot of people here. Uh, I call it footloose and fancy free, right? <laughs> so the average age of first childbirth, right, for uh, college educated women in 1970 was 21, okay? That has moved back to 26, right? So that's an extra five years, right? And then if you kind of look at a lot of people who kind of graduate college 21, who might actually have had first children in 26 and are now having it at 30, but the average statistics, right, has put in an extra five years. So what I call the footloose and fancy free time, the kind of college, studio apartment, Chinese food, video game, I don't have any responsibility, I'm not going to church, religion, any of that stuff, <laughs> time that used to be five years is now 10 years of your life, right? And so that has profound impact on all of those things, right? And if you like that sort of thing, you got an extra five years, right? <laughs> and it ha you know, and, and if, <clears throat> but if you're sitting there, if you're sitting there with a with a church or religious institution that usually counts on people having children and responsibility and so forth, well, you might be putting in a rock band. You might be trying to figure out how am I going to attract a different type of person earlier because I'm going to be looking at the obvious change in demographics and reality if I'm building apartments or reality. So, <clears throat> so there are a lot of things. Either, you can, either you're an institution or a business and you can sit there and watch this happen or you've got to move, you know, move to the changing realities. Internet married, you know, no one used to admit that they ever met anyone on the internet. <clears throat> I think that's changing. 35% of U.S. couples married between 2005 and 2012 met online. I mean, this is, you know, a tremendous change because, because internet, never forget that, that internet meetings also changed social dynamics because in the past people married people they met, you know, again, religious institution, school, then as everyone went to work at the workplace, but a pretty narrow social set, a friend who set them up, Internet then actually means more diverse marriages, culturally, uh, even in every imaginable way. So it breaks down a lot of social, social barriers, right, when more people marry uh, in the Internet, right? And it turns out that Internet dating so far seems to be associated with less breakup and higher satisfaction, although the source of those studies tends to be Match.com, so, you know. <laughs> I'm holding off on final judgment. Uh, college dropouts, you know, we got a lot more people. <clears throat> we got a lot more people into college, but we still have a lot of people dropping out of college. Uh, and so I think that, you, you know, we, we, you know, there's still a high school dropout problem, but it is a lot less severe than it was. Uh, but we pushed people in, in, and I think we could do a lot more. Uh, we have the worst, uh, college completion rate of a lot of countries. Uh, I have a thing about impressionable elites, which is particularly, I think, in politics. You know, I had this thing when I was doing the Hillary campaign, there would be, to me, two times the people who would come up to me, one kind would say, you know, uh, uh, I, I, if they if should just be a little bit more likable, I'd vote for her. That was always a PhD. And then somebody would come up to me and say, you know, if I just could find out if a little bit more about her health care plan, I'd vote for her. That was a middle class voter, right? And, and the pattern would become clear to me. And after a while, I'd realize that the, why would the more highly educated voter, you know, B 
be interested in likability and the middle class voter interested in health care plans and I thought it would be the reverse. But then I realized that the more highly educated voters, they have health care plans, they don't care about the plans. <laughs> and they're now become impressionable elites, very susceptible to kind of what they hear. And they read kind of, you know, uh, Maureen Dowd and other columns and they say that she should be more likable. And that middle class voters are actually looking for health care plan. They're actually living the everyday issues. And, and middle class voters are typically far more educated, much more information oriented, and turn out to be increasingly issue uh, driven. So uh, that we have a kind of an almost flip that they, the more responsible middle class electorate and the elites are becoming more impressionable. So, so and I, I think that trend uh, continues. So, you know, I thought I'd, <clears throat> I'm giving you some overview trends. I thought I'd give you a few surprise, surprise tech trends. I see this one didn't technically come out, but, but if it did come out, uh, the bottom blue here is the number of minutes uh, that people spend on their desktop or, or laptop, same thing. Then, then you've got their, uh, uh, then you've got their smartphone, and then you've got their tablet, and then you have how that changed, right? And so it's kind of interesting to see, uh, to see kind of what happened to technology minutes. Uh, contrary to what people think, the time that people spend really in productivity on their desktop or their laptop didn't really change. Uh, it stayed about the same, it kind of grow, grew with population. Uh, what happened was all the other time that people had, you know, listening to this talk, walking on the street, going to the bathroom, they take out their smartphone. And so they have all these additional technology minutes, going to bed, et cetera. So the time that they spend on their lives in technology is what dramatically increased. And in fact, the average person checks their smartphone 150 times a day, right? An amazing number of times, right? This audience, like 200, right? <laughs> right? And, but as you see, so, so that's why the desktop is, has remained so valuable and productive, and on top of this has been built a whole infrastructure uh, of mobile minutes. And then actually, you know, if you look at where we're going to see the biggest growth in technology, right now I'm ex expecting the biggest growth in technology not to be in China, but in India in the next year, because so much of India, still 90% of India is really not, not online and not on smartphones. But we're, uh, <clears throat> but we're, I think you could see a tremendous amount of growth there. You know, interestingly, you're seeing a big, a big shift we're the most likely purchasers right now of tablets, uh, laptops, and smartphones, a little bit more women than men, right? And so in, in terms of the trends, men are the most likely purchasers of big screen TVs, however. <laughs> they love. And actually, now uh, African American and Latino households per household actually spend more on consumer technology Right, than even uh, uh, white households. Uh, they're larger households and they've got tremendous enthusiasm for entertainment. Uh, and then, you know, privacy. I, I believe a lot in privacy and, and people always tell me, ah, privacy, that's, that's so like 19th century. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I always explain to people that pri the privacy marketplace is best uh, understood by the phone book, right, in this country, because in the phone book, it used to be that the phone company had more or less a monopoly. So they'd list you in the phone book for free because they got extra calls. If you could find someone listed, you might call them and they'd pick up a dime. Uh, but they would charge you three bucks a month not to be listed. So the value of privacy was $36 a year three bucks a month not to be listed. They got 40% of the country to pay the three bucks a month. Right? So that tells you really what the privacy marketplace is. And interestingly, whenever I do studies now, what I find is about the same, right? 40, 45, 
percent indicate that they are really willing to pay the same two to four bucks a month, right, for some higher degree of privacy than they're getting now. So I don't believe that, you know, 100% of people want 100% of privacy and everything. I believe people want a, a significant degree of privacy about some of their activities, and there is a significant marketplace for privacy, and that, in fact, Snapchat, obviously, with its $10 billion, last time we did this slide, it's probably 15 by now, right? Valuation, you know, proves that because they tapped into that, right? And so are other messaging apps, because as soon as somebody came up with things that were more private, people immediately switched uh, to those kinds of methods of communication. <clears throat> you know, and, and having pointed out a number of trends, I did want to point out a few instances just to show you that I don't, how companies are, are, are maybe sometimes a little bit behind the trends. Uh, this is a little exercise, if I get the video to play. I'll show you like, so the question is, who do you think this is really targeted to? Go back to my golden rule that the video never plays. Okay, I'm going to get the tech person to play the video. Okay, who do you think they, this is targeted to? Men, right. Okay, well, in general, 65% of women, 65 of new car buyers are women. And 70% of new Fiat buyers are women. <laughs> so why do they make commercials like that, right? Because they don't actually follow who their own customers. Now, if your F-150 trucks are bought by men, right? But actually most cars, right, are actually bought by women in the United States, right? <clears throat> and of course, seniors actually buy most cars, even though most car ads also look like they're for young people. Who do you think this is targeted to? Let me try this. Okay, I told you left click. Okay. Now, maybe it's just me. Uh, ah, I know why. Sensational. New Lash Sensational Full Fan Effect Mascara from New York. Our unique fanning brush captures every layer of lashes for a sensational full fan effect. New Lash Sensational Full Fan Effect Mascara. Okay. Who do they target that to? What kind of women? Well, how young? 20s and 30s, right? So, of course, they show this on... My 12-year-old's favorite show, right? Pretty Little Liars. <laughs> so, but you know, my point being that the truth is we talk about a world of sophisticated targeting and the internet and micro-scoring and everything, and the truth is we're a long way from targeting perfection, 
truth is most advertising is kind of really pretty roughly targeted. Uh, if, you were to, if you were to look at, at something, it would be pretty easy to watch an hour of TV uh, and find you know, examples of, of poorly targeted stuff like this. I mean, you, you know, we look at kind of the shape of clothing. The average American uh, woman is size 14, right? But Abercrombie and Fitch doesn't even sell sizes beyond 10, right? Uh, and, and so there's a huge disconnect uh, on, a lot of the, on a lot of this stuff. And, and a lot of this targeting, it, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I was behind what became soccer moms, right? And because they were not, <clears throat> really they were not targeting women. What, what the Democratic Party was targeting was downscale, non-college union men, okay? Well, they weren't making any more of those. Right? What they were making was women with some kids in some college who were going into the workforce, and they were concerned about their kids during the day. And so I said, well, you know, we've got to shift our target because we're going to lose if we keep targeting people that, that, that are on the decline. And so, so that was a pretty sh big shift that then caught on, you know, in marketing and, and became, you know, what became known as soccer moms. So, so what can we expect, right, trend-wise in politics? Well, first, you can expect that politics may not follow the trends based on the rest of my talk. They may be five years. You know, I was having a conversation with one of your professors about the need for new STEM jobs, and yet politics today mostly talk about manufacturing jobs because the swing states tend to be manufacturing states. We haven't created net manufacturing jobs in this country for 30 years. And I did, a, I did a poll of parents in this country. Do you want your child to work in a manufacturing job? 95% of parents said no. Right? They want their, their kids to work in a non-manufacturing job. And yet, most of the political debate is interestingly about manufacturing job. So let's take a little bit about what's happening to the electorate. Well, first of all, as I said earlier, the electorate is getting older, and we've crisscrossed the lines so that 23% in 2012 was over 60, and 19% is 18 to 29. So we're beginning to get to the place. I mean, if this doesn't happen, if seniors don't get bigger and bigger, then we won't have a social security crisis. <laughs> so take your pick, right? Because we could have faster and more immigration and then we would have less of a social security crisis and then we'll change the, er the age curve, but the electorate is getting, is getting older. So the, the same generation, if you think about it, all those people who voted for Kennedy voted for Romney, right? So what happens to people from the time when they vote for Kennedy? So this may happen to you, it may not, right? So the question will be all the people who voted for Obama, what will you vote for? Who will you vote for 50 years from now? Will you Will you change when you become seniors? Well, I don't know. That'll be for you. If you take a look about suburban and rural, right? So look at this, this line, the 29%. That was rural. Whoa. Take a look at that. That's dropped all the way down to 14. So we've lost a lot of rural people. Look at that blue line, the suburbs went all the way up to, uh, all the way up to 47, right? Small cities went up, big cities went up, but basically people moved from the rural areas to the suburban areas in, big, in, in significant numbers during this time. What happened to education? Well, wow, look at that college grad number. Almost at a majority. Look at that less than high school in the electorate. Wow, 3%. This is an incredibly educated electorate, amazingly so. They know information, they begin to know issues. Dramatic change. Look at the income. You know, there's a lot of talk about the 1% and the billionaires. The rest of the folks, incredible change. When I ask people what the percentage of the electorate is that's over 100,000, most people guess 5 or 10%. Very few people guess that, in, that it was 28%. In 2012, it'll probably be 32%. The, 
that if you look at the three income categories, the under 50,000 has dramatically come down, the over 100,000 has dramatically come up, and that the three categories are roughly equal uh, in the middle. There's a new professional class. If I ask people, are you a professional? 55% of Americans classify themselves as a professional. Now, obviously, they're not doctors and lawyers, but they consider what they do professional work, right? It's how they've redefined work. Being a professional is the new middle class. It's the new upper middle class, right? They just dramatically skyrocketed, right? And, it, and, and if you look, over 100,000 college grad in the suburbs, the three biggest moving trends, right, in the last 35 years. The new professionals support free enterprise, sensible government regulations, and they've also been behind social progressive movement. Rise of minority mo voters, right, was 89% white down to 72%, right? <clears throat> the total minority vote up to 26%. The rise of the Hispanic electorate, 1992, when President Clinton was first elected, it was 2%, now up to 10%, and continuing to rise. Latinos are young, in, in critical swing states, typically vote Democratic, 60 to 70%. And the biggest party in America, for all the talk about polarization, the biggest party is no party. Now, I saw an analysis the other day explaining to me that because everyone who's in no party winds up voting for a Democrat or Republican reliably, that of course they're not really independent. Now, this is like saying that if I open an ice cream store and I only give you vanilla and chocolate, because you only choose either vanilla and chocolate, you can't possibly like strawberry, okay? Now, go back to my analogy in the beginning of the talk that it's an age of the Starbucks of the economy. Well, there are only two things left where you only have two choices, red and white wine and politics. And you have rosé and you have like the Green Party, but so you have some <laughs> like choices, okay? Everything else you have a zillion choices on. But that's the false read. The truth is, the truth is I believe that, that there has been this huge unaffiliation of people and a huge movement of swing, but because the, the voters have moved ahead of the institutions, doesn't surprise me at all. In this entire talk, the trends move ahead of the institutions every time. How will the institutions react to the trend? The first thing they do is deny the trend. Then will they react and absorb the trend? Because we are at the end of the day, party, you know, if you go back to Franklin Roosevelt's time, 85% were affiliated with a party. We were truly a country that was red or blue. So, and I think this is the final point I make before taking questions, you know, in politics, and I think if you, if you look at, at, what's, at what's developed, you can have a base election or a swing election, right? So when we ran our election in 1996, and I think you've seen in, I think, fairly in Obama's first election, uh, he ran an election of hope and change. We ran an election uh, to try to bring in people with a balanced budget, yet to preserve Medicare and Medicaid education and the environment, according to our values. We tried to, to persuade, you know, that the percentage of people above 50% to come support us. And when you have what's what I call a swing election, and you win a swing election, then the leader who wins a swing election, the next day walks into the White House with a like 60, 65 percent approval rating and a huge mandate for change. As these elections have gotten more money and you have a billion dollars to run an election, you can run instead a base election. Bush ran a base re-election, Obama ran a base re-election. You could say, you know what, I'm not going to get these swing voters. What I'm going to do is get more of my base supporters to turn out, huge numbers of them. And I'm just going to focus all my money in 10 or 11 swing states, because now I can spend 
500 bucks a swing voter, right? <clears throat> and in that election, I can still win, so I have a second path to victory, right? I can get huge Christian evangelical, or I might get huge African American turnout, and that could get me the path. But you know what happens? The day after I win, I still have 49% approval. I don't have a majority for governing in a base election victory. <clears throat> so in those two ways of winning, my only thing, and two ways of kind of using the internet and the modern techniques, I'm just hoping we have a swing election, right, coming up. We're gonna have two new candidates, neither of them president. I hope they will both go to bring people together to try to win the other 10 or 15% when they win, so that when they walk into office, they will have more than a majority supporting them so that they have a mandate to govern. And then they will be able, I think, to take advantage of some of the trends that you see in the talk. Thank you. Okay. We can take a few questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll come by with a microphone. As always, preference goes to students. Uh, hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, my question relates to just how we as students and then professionals can really keep up with these trends. I mean, you do it for a living, but for us, for me, it feels like I always hear about these trends later and then I have no way of applying them to anything I'm doing. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, that's, that's actually a good question. I mean, again, part of it depends upon what field you're in. I mean, I don't think you have to keep, keep aware. The question is what, if you're, if you're in a particular field, you should try to learn the trends that might affect your field. What, what are you going into or what are you in? Like, so if you're in technology, like it, it's, it's actually very interesting because technology is a field where I think it's very important to both understand where the customer is going and also to understand what the competition is doing. I think it's very easy in technology to say, hey, I do this product, like I make this thing, and so now I'm gonna add a feature to this thing. Well, today you push a button, so now maybe I'll add voice to it, or maybe I'll add a softer touch, or add a little screen. And so that's what I call inside out, right? Outside in is, is is really discovering that you know the problem Mark has is the videos never play, so he should have a button here that says video, right? <laughs> right, and so and the trend being that most presentations include video, and then maybe the next trend is presentations will include uh, skyping people in. So, so how do you kind of how do you kind of then look at it from an outside in? So a lot of it is just spending time thinking about things outside in instead of inside out, right? And the more, so, and, and it's a balance, right? And so the more time you spend doing that in your field, I think the, the higher the probability of success is. Thank you for your talk. I want to ask, I want to ask, um, given that there's this sort of conversation all the time about big data, that we have this sense we have more and more information than ever before about what people do, the trends they use, the kind of technologies they use, and the way we talk about that seems to be collectively a lot more informed, and yet, I think as a popular kind of consciousness, we don't really have an awareness of, again, what you've alluded to as being micro-trends. So why do you think it is that we don't really have a better understanding or an adaptation to these um, ways of looking at information, given that we have so much readily available? And what do you see as being kind of the way we go forward in using the degree to which we have access to all this information in the future? Well, I mean, I think there, there, there are a couple of things. First, I think people look to data as like, as, as like a black box that's going to just do things automatically rather than something they have to understand. And then second, uh, I think somebody maybe at the table uh, was talking about doctors. You know, the approach to data really has to be like what a doctor does, which is, and, and I admire the doctor's model. You go to the doctor and they have just three or four basic indicators. So they take your heartbeat, they take your temperature, they take your blood pressure, 
and then maybe they're going to do a blood test that's got 10 more things. But you know, they have a, a very small number of top level things, even though there's a million, if I wanted to, I could keep track of a million things about you. But they've got it down, and you know what, if there's, if there's nothing wrong with those things, and you're feeling okay, they're getting you out of there, right? Okay? And if there's something, if all the, right? And then if there's something, even if you're feeling fine, but there's an anomaly in those things. So they've actually figured out how to get the data down to something manageable, readable, trackable, right? And that doesn't like overwhelm them. And so that's kind of how, what we have to kind of figure out in, in more and more fields. Right, how to do that, how to have good indicators of what's healthy and what's not, not healthy and how to track that. I mean, when it, comes to not, when it comes to food, for example, we're confused, right? Because we have gotten so confused about the, about the science of food. We know that calories is a good indicator, but we've, we don't under, between carbohydrates, protein, fat, not fat, saturated fat and salt, we have, con we have contradictory science and views on each and every one of them now, right? So we can't have clarity until we have, until we have some scientific basis of that. So I don't know if that helps you, but you can't have, you're gonna have, you're, you're never clear until you have some clarity like the doctor has, right? And when you have that, then you kind of have what to track. So in political polling, for example, I'll give you one example, we know right track, wrong track of the country and favorability of the candidates will, and familiarity of the candidates will probably tell you 75% of what's going on in any political race, right then and there, right? Because your incumbent is in trouble if people think things were in the wrong track. <clears throat> and if they're well liked despite that, they have a chance. And if they're, if they're disliked and, it, and people don't like the direction of the country, pretty much curtains. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, kudos on the presentation, it was, I loved it. Thank you. Um, my question pertains to confirmation bias and this cognitive cherry picking of evidence that we see around us. For example, now that you told me that men buy flat screen TVs, all I'm gonna see is men with flat screen TVs. Um, so how do we keep up with the trends, just like Kyle asked, um, without this confirmation bias of the information that's shown to us. Yeah, you know, I can't help that. <clears throat> I, mean, I mean, you're right, because in fact, I think it's getting worse, right? Because what, what the internet is promoting is, is, is just, is promoting that because, it, you know, I love the thing about the, um, that story about the Walmart clerk who had absolutely nothing special about him, but he got his picture promoted to like a couple hundred thousand people. And, and there was nothing special about it, right? And so with the problem we have with the internet is that things can get focused upon that have almost no meaning and, and value and then take on a life of their own. And that, that this, frankly, is a growing, is a growing problem. And so uh, uh, since, since I consider that a valid data point, I'm okay with your thinking that for a while. And so the question is, when should you reconsider that perspective, right? I don't think you should reconsider that perspective next year, right? You might, re you might go back and look at that two or three years from now to see if there's been a change in flat screen TVs because you know, maybe, uh, maybe there's been a change in the, the programming. I mean, there's usually some other change. Why should you reconsider it? What's a reasonable interval in time? Like when I wrote Microtrends in 2007, I updated it in nine. I think about now, I could write another book on it. Between now and then, there wasn't enough change for most of the trends. So I'm saying it's, it's okay for you, to, uh, for you to be fresh now and not have to feel that you've gotta every night go back and, and do, do a refresh, except for those things that really do change kind of nightly or that are really important like that. But my biggest problem now is what is going on is that there can be so many false reads on information that turns out to be unimportant or false. Uh, because, because random things can get huge attention on the internet that, t that turn out to be wrong, and it's just too late. And, and you know, we've seen that you know, in several journalistic instances now, too. We will have time for about two more questions. 
Fred Lynch, Department of Government. So here comes a question about politics. Uh, you're close to Hillary Clinton and a lot of the Democrats. Um, I'm wondering, they seem to be running a kind of a high risk primary and putting all their eggs in one basket. And if something happens to Hillary Clinton, she makes a huge mistake or God forbid there's a health problem. What do you see happening in the Democratic Party? Who would come forward to pick up the baton if something goes wrong with the Clinton candidacy? Well, I mean, I, I, don't, I think you're, the supposition, I think there's a problem with the supposition. It's like there's a committee somewhere that, that you know, I think people, people see Hillary as a, as a great choice, who's a strong candidate, and people are deciding, uh, deciding not, to, you know, not to run. And I think people have a, the, the nominating convention is, is next summer. And until then, you know, politics, politics can change up, in, uh, up, until, up until that moment. But she looks like a very strong candidate for now, and I think that's the decision that other Democrats individually are making. I don't think there's any, there's, there's no committee. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, um, thank you again for your talk. I was wondering, um, as we see more corporations like make Twitter pages from you know, Microsoft to even like a small startup, um, do you think this increased social interaction will demand an increased social consciousness on the firms of the future? I mean, like race together is a good example. Is that a good move, a bad move, but most importantly, like, will it be a necessary move five years from now? Well, uh, I don't think I don't think that they thought that race together worked out the way they thought it would, but but I think your your overall point is you know are our corporations do corporations are they showing a greater degree of social consciousness and I, I do think they are and, and in fact I think as corporations mature in as having this discussion with the with the professor which is that corporations as they're young are just so busy getting their product out right and then later on as they mature and they globalize. They realize, okay, well, now that we're a, a mature corporation, we've got, you know, a, a higher level of, of corporate and social responsibility, not just here, but around the world and where we operate. And plus, corporations have so many thorny questions of how they're going to operate in different environments, in different cultures, in different political systems now, that they can't, inv can't avoid having kind of uh, both huge internal discussions and mechanisms, you know, for making some uh, some real decisions about where they'll operate and how they how they will operate and how they'll be responsible. So I think that the two, <clears throat> if you're a modern global business, the two are really in, inseparable today from from operating. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Please join me in thanking our guest, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.